How does idealism arise? Lenin said in this little draft text called On the Question of Dialectics in his uh, notebooks, quote, Philosophical idealism is a one-sided, exaggerated development, inflation, distension of one of the features, aspects, facets of knowledge into an absolute, divorced from matter, from nature, apotheoside, rectilinearity and one-sidedness, woodenness and petrification, subjectiveness and subjective blindness. Voila, the epistemological roots of idealism, unquote. So Lenin didn't think that idealists are just idiots. Somehow they just go wrong somewhere. They exaggerate the role of subjectivity. They separate the mind from matter, etc., etc. Quote, Certain social conditions are needed to turn the possibility of the emergence of idealism into a reality, to turn certain individual errors of cognition into a philosophical system. This comes about when the errors in cognition correspond to the demands of certain classes and social groups, and are supported by them. The social conditions required to bring about idealism are contradiction between manual and mental work, the appearance and development of classes, private ownership of the means of production, and exploitation of man by man. Intellectual activity, once it has broken away from manual labor, acquires a relatively autonomous character and becomes the privilege of the property-owning, exploiting classes. The ideologists of these classes, who treat manual labor with contempt, are deluded into thinking that mental activity is the determinative factor in the existence and development of society. Reactionary social classes have an interest in seeing that the development of cognition does not undermine the idealist and religious superstitions prevailing in a society based on exploitation. The need to preserve the interest of these classes is quite often the reason why certain individual idealist mistakes that occur in the process of cognition become reinforced and harden into definite systems of beliefs. Lenin wrote, Human knowledge is not a straight line but a curve, which endlessly approximates a series of circles, a spiral. Any fragment, segment, section of this curve can be transformed, transformed one-sidedly, into an independent, complete, straight line, which then, if one does not see the wood for the trees, leads into the quagmire, into clerical obscurantism, where it is anchored by the class interests of the ruling classes." Unquote. So, of course, people can think whatever they want, but what philosophical schools become influential, and where do people get their ideas? It is, of course, not a coincidence that Marx got his ideas about capitalism by observing capitalist society. If Marx had lived 2,000 years before, his ideas would surely have been different. Similarly, it's not a coincidence that Plato, who lived in ancient Greece, was an idealist. His teachers were idealists, and the entire Greek society considered manual labor to be unfit for human beings. Instead, they considered mental activity, spiritual pursuits, and contemplation most valuable. So is it any wonder that Plato then developed a philosophy where the mind is elevated to the utmost degree, and all physical things are called mere illusions? From this, Plato derived political views, which justified the existing order of things. For Plato, slavery was natural, and freeing the slaves would go against nature, against the will of the ultimate god, and be harmful for society. His student Aristotle shared many of these political views. They became the most influential thinkers, propped up by the status quo. Philosophical ideas are not born from nowhere. They always have definite sources. Two areas that I am personally familiar with is Marxism and H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft's influences have been studied extensively. So whatever he thought, people have figured out, oh, he must have gotten it from there. Same is true of Marx. If you read something like Lenin's The Three Sources and Three Component Parts of Marxism, it talks about the sources where Marx got his ideas. French Utopian Socialism, Classical German Philosophy, and British Political Economy. So they always have definite sources. Plato and Aristotle were truly great philosophers, but they were also clear products of their time and place. The success of Plato and Aristotle also didn't depend solely on the greatness of their philosophy, but also on the fact that it suited the rulers of those times. Their ideas were even utilized in a modified form throughout the Middle Ages, and were the mainstream philosophy of clerical feudalism. Now, let's talk about partisanship and objectivity in philosophy. 
Fundamentals of Marxist Leninist Philosophy says, quote, Philosophical world outlooks have a class partisan character. What is meant by partisanship of the philosophical world outlook? It implies mainly an adherence to one of the principal philosophical parties, materialism or idealism. Revisionists maintain that the communist parties should be neutral towards philosophy. Their programs should be neither materialist nor idealist. This revisionist preaching is presented as an attempt to unite all forces, but in reality it invites us to turn away from the struggle against bourgeois ideology, which, as we know, is infused with idealism. In contrast to the revisionist appeasement of bourgeois ideology, the philosophy of Marxism-Leninism is openly committed and partisan in its consistent championing of the principles of materialism. The revisionists say that by recognizing the partisanship of philosophical theory, the Marxists allow themselves to make an oversimplified division of philosophers into two camps, materialists and idealists. The revisionist argument that the division of philosophy into materialism and idealism leads to oversimplification is surprising to say the least. It is not the Marxists who divide philosophers into materialists and idealists. From time immemorial, philosophers have divided themselves into two camps, and the division has remained in force to this day. This is a real fact of the history of philosophy." Unquote. Of course, there have been numerous attempts to create a so-called third line in philosophy beyond materialism and idealism, but this has never worked. Quote, in the final analysis, the struggle between materialism and idealism reflects the struggle of classes in society. The class struggle is not confined to the economic or political sphere, and also finds expression in the sphere of world outlook. This struggle, which has proceeded throughout the development of class society, acquires a special intensity at turning points in history, when questions of world outlook come to the fore. Dialectical and historical materialism took shape as the philosophical basis of the world outlook of the consistently revolutionary class, the proletariat, as the ideological banner of the millions of the working people." Unquote. As Lenin said in The Attitude of the Workers' Party to Religion, Marxist philosophical materialism showed the proletariat a way out of the spiritual slavery. Fundamentals of Marxist-Leninist philosophy says, quote, Bourgeois ideologists, echoed by the revisionists, usually acclaim political neutrality in matters of theory as a synonym for objectivity. Some of them maintain that theory, including philosophical theory, stands above the practical, political interests of classes, social groups and parties, and thus represents knowledge for the sake of knowledge. The ideologists of the bourgeoisie and the revisionists acclaim uncommittedness and propose the idea of a third line in philosophy, which is supposedly superior to both materialism and idealism. But can there be in class society any ideologists, any thinkers, who soar above classes and disregard their interests? Such people do not exist. In fact, we constantly find that the very people who boast of their uncommittedness are in practice those who conduct a far from impartial struggle against the philosophy of Marxism-Leninism, who seek to overthrow it and replace it with the bourgeois world outlook." Unquote. This talk of, oh, well, I don't have an ideology, I don't believe in ideologies, well, first of all, that's not true. Everybody has some kind of worldview, everybody has some kind of ideology, and saying that they don't, that's really just the newest trend in capitalist liberalism. And actually, even liberals sometimes criticize this when the media takes two positions and one of them is clearly wrong and one of them is clearly correct, and the media treats them like they're both equally valid, like science versus religious fundamentalism. Is it really accurate to say, oh, the objective thing to do is to treat both these alternatives as viable? Well, obviously not. One of them is clearly wrong. The preponderance of evidence is clearly on one side, like evolution versus creationism. It doesn't make any sense to take a neutral stance between these, like, oh, I don't know, either one could really be true. Really what people mean by objectivity is that you shouldn't be blind to information that goes against your own biases. That's really what objectivity is. But objectivity doesn't mean that you have to be completely neutral and act like any position is as reasonable as another position. So for that reason, consistent materialism is partisan, 
We are not neutral in the struggle between materialism and idealism. We are firmly on one side, and there's no sense in trying to deny it. There's no sense in even trying to argue for some kind of neutrality here. Lenin said in What is to be done, quote, The only choice is either bourgeois or socialist ideology. There is no middle course, for mankind has not created a third ideology. And moreover, in a society torn by class antagonisms, there can never be a non-class or an above-class ideology. Hence, to belittle the socialist ideology in any way, to turn aside from it in the slightest degree, means to strengthen bourgeois ideology. Unquote. Well, why does he say that? Because, in our opinion, someone who takes a consistently scientific, consistently materialist point of view is going to be a Marxist-Leninist, and all attempts to go for some kind of agnosticism, where like, oh, I just don't know, or I'm neutral, or maybe it's all in my head, or maybe God made it, all those alternatives are against the real interest of the working class, they're against the real interest of the broad masses, and they're against the real interest of all progressive humanity in general. And there is no ideology, no philosophy, which is somehow completely separate from society, from history, from all material surroundings, to such a degree that it's just completely neutral and not class-based in any way. Such ideologies, such philosophies are impossible, they don't exist. But that said, even though every philosophy and every worldview is tied to the societal conditions, tied to class, that doesn't mean that it's simplistic. It's a bit more complicated than that. History of Philosophy, Volume 1, tries to make this a little bit more clear. Quote, Marxism-Leninism begins from the standpoint that the history of philosophy has always been the battlefield between the two sides in philosophy, materialism and idealism. The joint interest and ideology of various classes and social groupings have manifested in the struggle between materialism and idealism. Materialism declares itself partisan because it sees that philosophy, however it evaluates events, always takes the stand of this or that social group. On the other hand, many philosophers reflecting the ideology and interests of the ruling classes in societies based on exploitation have presented their teachings as supposedly above classes and sides, as universally human, eternal and absolute truth. Although the idealists disguise themselves under the garb of neutrality, they still attempt to wipe out materialism from the history of philosophy, representing idealism as the only really philosophical view. As important a philosopher as Hegel, in fact, left materialism outside the history of philosophy." Unquote. And you can see signs of this subtle ideological battle. Some of it is not even intentional, it's just that people have different points of view. For example, uh, Ture Lehen made fun of this Finnish encyclopedia from the 30s, which claimed that there were no important atheist philosophers. So just like Hegel was trying to leave materialism outside of history, that uh, Finnish encyclopedia was trying to leave atheism and materialism outside of uh, history. And just recently I was listening to a radio program by the Finnish state media talking about the history of philosophy and they only mentioned three sides in philosophy, objective idealism, subjective idealism and realism. <laughs> so they didn't even mention materialism at all. But is everybody who isn't a materialist, are they all just evil puppets of the capitalists? Uh, well, it's not as simple as that. So let's keep going. Quote, Philosophy, like other forms of ideology, have the characteristic of the relative independence of development. Every ideology, however, once it has arisen, develops in connection with the given concept material and develops this matter further, wrote Engels. As much as the development of philosophy is determined by the economic base, and in the final instance by the material conditions of society, it would be wrong to derive all philosophical trends directly from them. This is how the vulgarizers of Marxism a. Bogdanov, V. Solitakov, etc., acted, trying to explain every philosophical notion as being derived directly from the immediate interest of the bourgeoisie or from the development of capitalist production technique. And in fact, Bogdanov and Solitakov did so in order to justify their own erroneous, positivist position. If the direction of philosophical development is in the final instance determined by economic life of society, the content of philosophical trends 
particularly logical categories, forms in which philosophical thinking develops, do not directly derive from the economy, but are to a significant degree related to the ideological struggle of their time, to the development of other forms of social consciousness, art, religion, etc., to science, and to that concept material philosophers inherit from their predecessors. There we see the relative independence of philosophical development. Unquote. So that's a very sciencey way of putting it, but if you really think about it, it's pretty obvious. There can't be philosophy which is just completely separate from class, completely separate from its time and its place. That's impossible, obviously. But at the same time, philosophical systems have been passed down through history, so we can inherit them from the past, we can get influences from the past, we can get influences from other forms of ideology, so art, religion, politics, etc., and combine those into philosophy. Philosophers are connected to the broader struggle between philosophical trends, which could be very influential in the culture of the time or the philosophical landscape of the time. They are tied to objective conditions and class, but they're not directly tied to them. They're not completely independent from them, but they are relatively independent. They have a relative independence. Quote, The relative independence of philosophy is shown also by the fact that philosophical thinking, which reflects societal life and in the main corresponds to the character of the economic base, can fall behind in development compared to the economic base or advance ahead of it. Thus, in the period of the movements of liberation against feudalism, the progressive philosophy related to these movements often acquired idealistic religious forms. Religion was the ruling ideology of feudalism. This means that the philosophy lacked behind. A clear example of philosophical development marching ahead of societal development is provided by the developed dialectical and historical materialism born during capitalism, but which forms the theoretical basis of the ideology of socialism. The relative independence of philosophy is shown also by the fact that philosophical thought sometimes achieves a high level in countries which in their economic or political development have fallen somewhat behind from others. Engels wrote, But the philosophy of every epoch, since it is a definite sphere in the division of labor, has as its presupposition a certain definite intellectual material handed down to it by its predecessors, from which it takes its start. And that is why economically backward countries can still play first fiddle in philosophy. France in the 18th century compared with England, on whose philosophy the French based themselves, and later Germany in comparison with both. But the philosophy both of France and Germany, and the general blossoming of literature at that time, were also the result of a rising economic development." Unquote. Philosophy as a particular form of comprehending the world, as a system of views concerning the most general questions of being and thinking, has its own internal logic. It manifests in a generalized form the laws governing comprehension of the world, which are reflection of the objective laws of natural and societal being. Philosophy has its own specific laws, which only partially manifest in other areas of societal consciousness, science, art, socio-political ideology, if philosophy ideologically or theoretically influences them." Unquote. So, if according to Marxism, the ideology of the society the superstructure of the society, so ideology, philosophy, etc., is created by the economic base, how is it possible that a less developed society can have similar philosophical trends to a more highly economically developed society? Well, obviously they were influenced by them. So although Germany was economically less developed than England and France, it still was influenced by their philosophies, Although, again, it is worth noting the differences between the arising bourgeois philosophy of Germany and the rising bourgeois philosophy of France. Philosophy is part of the ideological superstructure, but it's not the same as other parts of it. Science is one thing, art is one thing, political ideology is one thing, philosophy is its own thing. So specific trends in philosophy are struggle between materialism and idealism, for example which is also visible in politics, science, art, etc., but not in the exact same way. Fundamentals of Marxist philosophy makes the following points. Quote, it is not a coincidence that modern bourgeois philosophy supports idealism, 
Though two centuries ago in France, those philosophers who were the exponents of the ideology of the revolutionary bourgeoisie defended materialism, this kind of change in philosophical position is explained by a change in the position of the class whose ideological views it expounds. The bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, has gone from being a progressive, revolutionary, rising class to being a reactionary, dying class." Unquote. And that, I think, explains it quite well. Bourgeois philosophy was so progressive in its time, particularly in revolutionary France you had the materialist philosophers, even in Germany you had Hegel who had a progressive role in philosophy, although he was still made into a tool of the state, and then you had Feuerbach who was a real materialist and again was persecuted for it, but these days bourgeois philosophy doesn't have any of these progressive characteristics. The only consistent materialists are Marxists, and the proponents of the working class ideology. Bourgeois philosophy has really run into a deep crisis. All the contemporary bourgeois philosophical trends are outright terrible. They are really the ideology of a decrepit, decaying class and a decaying society. Quote, It is very telling that modern bourgeois philosophy almost in its entirety supports agnosticism. It denies the possibility of human reason to understand the world and the nature of phenomena, and asserts powerlessness of logical thinking. This is one manifestation of the decay of capitalism and the bourgeoisie who has long since lost its proud belief in societal progress and the creative powers of human rationality." Unquote. Quote, in the history of philosophy, there have been and still are many attempts to avoid the contradiction between materialism and idealism in a cowardly way and create some third philosophical trend, which would be neither materialist or idealist but those attempts are fruitless. They lead to eclecticism, that is, covert idealism expressed in new words. It is particularly characteristic for modern bourgeois philosophy. Many bourgeois philosophers claim that mind and matter are only meaningless words, and therefore philosophy should not investigate questions relating to their interrelation. In their view, the question of the relationship between being and consciousness is not a fundamental question of philosophy, and in general doesn't deserve the attention of philosophers. It is meaningless. What do these philosophers see as the subject matter of philosophy? Famous British philosopher Burton Russell argues that philosophy cannot give any new information about the world. Its goal is only to give a logical analysis of scientific comprehension. Therefore, logic, which is considered a formal science, constitutes the main content of philosophy. This stance is an attempt to dodge the fundamental question of worldview. Another proponent of modern positivism, R. Carnap, argues that logical analysis is fundamentally analysis of language, that, quote, logic is syntax, unquote. And the task of the philosopher is the logical analysis of words, sentences, etc. The philosopher must accept that he simply does not have the ability to provide answers to questions about the world. Problems of philosophy, Carnap explains, quote, do not concern discovering the fundamental nature of reality, but the semantic analysis of the structure of the language of science, including the theoretical part of everyday language, unquote. Such a view means attempting to strip philosophy of its subject matter, unquote. Okay, now I want to talk about philosophical progress. Is there progress in philosophy? Does philosophy develop? If we begin from a scientific materialist position, then we have to admit that there is development in philosophy. We have more knowledge than in the past, we have more accurate knowledge than in the past. Though our theories are far from perfect, they correspond to reality better than older theories, and many later ideas are clearly better than many ancient ideas. Those who are prone to idealism, though, may claim relativistically that there is simply an assortment of different philosophical opinions which are all equally true or false, or that it's a matter of personal taste which you prefer, or that there is no way to know which one is true. Some deny that the history of philosophy is a real subject matter of investigation, while others deny that there is any rhyme or reason in it. Now, the Marxist position is that the history of philosophy exists, it's a genuine subject matter of investigation, and there are certain reasons why the history of philosophy has developed the way it has. It's not random, it's not subjectivist, it's an objective process of 
historical development based on actual reasons. Capitalist philosophy cannot see philosophical progress and cannot define what philosophy is false and what philosophy is correct. A contemporary philosopher named Richard Carrier went as far as to say that modern philosophy altogether is just pseudo-philosophy. He said that modern philosophy doesn't have any real criteria for what is good or bad, so it's basically all just nonsense and pseudo-philosophy, as he called it. And though he's not a Marxist of any kind, he does have a point. He's clearly um, looking at the state of modern capitalist philosophy and, you know, he's pessimistic about it. He's disappointed in it. There are several reasons why contemporary capitalist philosophy cannot see any genuine historical progress and cannot define what philosophy is good and what philosophy is bad. They have a worldview which prevents them from doing that, but they also have a very real economic and political class interest to hold the position that they do. The capitalist class has established its own philosophical trends, which at one point in history were progressive and revolutionary long time ago, but now the capitalist class has become completely reactionary. They've established their own system, capitalism, they're in power, they have no reason to want to go beyond it. Quite the contrary, they have what they want and they just want to hold on to it. In their hands, philosophy has become seemingly completely useless and pointless, endless discussion with no result and just rehashing of old questions. Characteristic of how they don't accept any philosophical progress is that many of the modern capitalist philosophical trends are based on rejection of core philosophical questions, denying that those questions even exist, or saying that we can't find answers to them so there's no point in looking at them, just rejecting core areas of philosophical investigation, or bringing back old and outdated systems, like neo-Kantianism, neo-scholasticism, neo-Aristotelianism, so on and so forth. And there are countless other, more subtle forms of just rehashing old ideas instead of going forward. Now, there are also those who want to forget about all old philosophy because we supposedly have no further use for it. But that's also a mistake. I know it's a cliché, but it's still true that to understand our present, we have to understand our past. Even ancient philosophers, despite being incorrect on many things, still had a necessary and progressive role to play. They developed philosophy towards the point where it is now. The history of philosophy from our point of view may look a bit comical, since materialism was already discovered thousands of years ago. I mentioned before that the first Greek philosophers were materialists, but then it went out of fashion and has only become prevalent again recently. So it may look a little stupid, like, okay, well, if the point was to have materialism, we had that thousands of years ago, then we took this weird detour to other things, and now we're back. Well, it's not as simple as that. The ancient materialism was obviously not the same as modern materialism. It was way different and it was actually necessary to go through these twists and turns to get here. Many new questions were raised and answered. Even the time in the Middle Ages, the so-called Dark Ages, were not entirely wasted. That is not to say that every philosophical thinker was always progressive. There's always been steps backward and ups and downs, but generally speaking, there has been legitimate philosophical progress. Even various thinkers who were largely wrong could still have advanced philosophy from an objective standpoint. This is from The History of Philosophy, Volume 1. Quote, Marxism examines and evaluates philosophical systems of the past from a concrete historical point of view. Lenin said that thinkers should not be evaluated based on what they haven't provided compared to modern requirements, but based on what they provided compared to their predecessors. Lenin explained, quote, The whole spirit of Marxism its whole system demands that each proposition should be considered alpha only historically, beta only in connection with others, gamma only in connection with the concrete experience of history, unquote. A scientific history of philosophy follows the principle of Marxist historicism. It doesn't simply reject idealism, but investigates the roots and essence of idealist theories, examines the contradictions within these theories, and the valuable elements of some idealist systems.
for example philosophy of Hegel and his dialectics. It demonstrates that although those systems are barren, they nonetheless grow in the living tree of human knowledge. They are derived from the process of cognition itself. They have their theoretical roots in departing from the path of real knowledge to one-sidedness, subjectivity, etc. The interests of the ruling class have helped these departures from truth become permanent and grow into full philosophical systems, which unite with religion and oftentimes are foreign to real science. Engels pointed out that idealism is an incorrect, but in the context of its time, and related to the development of knowledge, a necessary form of philosophy, unquote. You know, the revisionists or some other people might claim that Marxists, they're so dogmatic or so close-minded, they want to throw out all philosophy that's not Marxist, or they don't appreciate any philosophy that's not Marxist. Well, that's not actually true. In fact, you tend to see a lot of capitalist philosophers who either want to just throw out all the old philosophy as pointless, or they claim that philosophy doesn't have any history, or that the history of philosophy is not worth examining. Marxists don't want to do that. We think that the history of philosophy is valuable. There were plenty of great philosophical thinkers before Marx and Engels, who had a progressive role in history, whose works are still worth studying today. We just think that many of those systems are outdated. You know, we can recognize that Aristotle was a genius, but he was also wrong about a ton of things. Probably most things. But like Lenin said, he must be looked at in his historical context and compared to his predecessors. Well, from that criteria, there's not that much you can criticize him for. Quote, In approaching philosophical doctrines historically, the Marxist history of philosophy takes into account the valuable elements in the systems of past thinkers. Aristotle, Bacon, Feuerbach, Herzen, Chernyshevsky, etc. Therefore Marxism values the rational kernel in Hegel's history of philosophy, that is, Hegel's investigation, albeit from a false idealist position, of the law-governed connection and continuity in development of different philosophical doctrines. As a result, the history of philosophy was shown as a historical process of development of knowledge and not as a chaos of positions and views accumulating on top of each other. Hegel also deserves recognition for tracking the development of dialectics in the history of philosophy. In speaking of the scientific achievements of bourgeois scientists, knowingly or unknowingly, acting as salesmen of the ruling classes in capitalist society, Lenin considered it the task of the Marxists, quote, to be able to master and adapt the achievements of these salesmen and to be able to lop off their reactionary tendency to pursue your own line and to combat the whole alignment of forces and classes hostile to us. This also applies to the history of philosophy, unquote. Quote, Today, there is a fierce ideological debate about the principles of the history of philosophy, its subject matter and methods between Marxism-Leninism and modern reactionary idealist doctrines. Many representatives of neo-positivism a widespread modern idealist trend, Philip Frank, L. Wittgenstein, B. Russell, R. Carnap, etc., actually deny that philosophy has its own subject matter, separate from specialized sciences. They limit the task of philosophy to investigating the methods and tools of logical thinking and the structure of the language of science. Such a view of the subject matter of philosophy leads to those philosophers denying the positive content of the history of philosophy and denying the significant independent role of this science in understanding the world. The proponents of existentialism, another major trend in modern bourgeois philosophy, present a somewhat different, though from a Marxist standpoint equally erroneous view of the history of philosophy. Karl Jaspers considers it impossible to investigate the history of philosophy as an objective, coherent historical process though he doesn't deny the necessity of investigating the history of philosophy. According to Jaspers, every philosopher is free from history, the creator of their own individual subjective world, and philosophy generally is the quote-unquote timeless struggle of spirits. Because of the subjectivism of Jaspers and the other existentialists, they actually deal with the facts of the history of philosophy completely arbitrarily. It's not a coincidence that Jaspers unites philosophers of different time periods and trends, for example Plato and Kant, Hobbes and Fichte, 
Thomas Aquinas and Hegel, Cicero and Voltaire, into quote-unquote groups, without caring about the true history of philosophical thought. As a result of arbitrary treatment of historical facts, we see the separation of the true history of philosophy from historical realities, development of science and ideological struggles. Certain other modern idealist philosophical trends, for example, neo-Thomists, spiritualists, and certain supporters of objective idealism, hold to a view close to religion, according to which the subject matter of philosophical investigation has always been some eternal absolute spirit, world reason, which turns out to be a pseudonym for God. Therefore, modern bourgeois historians of philosophy, including those who subjugate philosophy under religion and consider history of philosophy an appendage of history of religion, and those who consider history of philosophy to be the subjective creation of individual thinkers, in reality, separate the history of philosophy from the true historical development of society and science. Unquote. So once again, if you want to have a scientific point of view, then you shouldn't just say, there's just a bunch of philosophical trends, just pick whatever you think is most interesting or something. It's not relative like that. It also doesn't make sense to say that history of philosophy is not a real discipline and we can't learn anything about it, we shouldn't look at it. But equally, to say that the history of philosophy is just a bunch of philosophical thinkers just coming out of nowhere and coming up with ideas, and then other philosophical thinkers coming out of nowhere and just having ideas, that's just a completely reactionary position. Philosophers are obviously not independent of history. They're actually very much tied to the objective conditions of where they are at, what is happening in the world, what is happening in philosophy at the time. To me, it's insane that anyone would have to even argue this point. Good example, there couldn't be Descartes if there wasn't Aristotle. There also couldn't be Kant if there wasn't Hume. So philosophers are obviously not just free from history. They just come and go out of nowhere. Like they're, they're just completely free to make any theories they want. No. Kant's philosophy was to a large extent influenced by Hume. That couldn't have possibly happened if Hume didn't exist first. I don't know, this total explicit denunciation of rational thinking just grinds my gears. But, if we accept that there is a history of philosophy, philosophy develops, and its development is tied to the development of human society generally, of the productive forces, of science, of the ideological superstructure, etc., etc. It's tied to those, but it's not the exact same thing as those. If we realize that, the history of philosophy is still not just a simple list of like, okay, first you had people who thought this, then you had people who thought this, then you had other people who thought this. It's not a simple cataloging of philosophers that existed and stuff they said. The history of philosophy is itself a process of the development of knowledge which follows a certain rationale, it follows a certain logic of its own, it follows certain laws of development. Just like the world generally has laws of development, just like society has laws of development, the history of philosophy also has laws of development. And one important person who pointed this out was Hegel. Even though Hegel's history of philosophy is severely flawed because it's very biased against materialism, it's a very narrow-minded history of philosophy, but at least he figured out that history of philosophy could be looked at as a law-governed process. Engels pointed out, quote, Philosophers were by no means impelled, as they thought they were, solely by the force of pure reason. On the contrary, what really pushed them forward was the powerful and ever more rapidly unrushing progress of natural science and industry, unquote. Especially idealist philosophers, they liked to think that they're just guided by the pure force of their reason and their mind, but that's not how history actually develops. And every time new scientific discoveries were made, every time the structure of society changed, philosophy was impacted by it. Slave societies had philosophers who supported slavery, feudal societies had philosophers who had some position or other regarding feudalism, capitalist society has produced its own types of philosophers. Quote, the general sociological law-governed development of societal consciousness 
manifests in class society also as the dependence of societal consciousness on class struggle. Class struggle is carried out in the realm of politics as well as in the realm of ideology. In class societies, philosophical doctrines manifest the worldview of definite classes or social groupings. They are essentially tied to class. The connection between the national and international developmental conditions of social consciousness manifest in a law-governed way in the history of ideology, including philosophy. The development of each nation's philosophical thought depends on many factors, not only the country's economic life and struggle between classes. If the nation is in economic, political and ideological interaction with other nations, it receives influences from the philosophy and societal thought of those nations. Marxist history of philosophy opposes the erroneous belief of those philosophers who think that certain nations have given contributions to philosophical development, while other nations have contributed nothing or almost nothing to the treasury of philosophical thought. Hegel believed that only such West European peoples as the Greeks, Romans, and in particular the Germans, had fulfilled in their so-called national spirit the philosophical principles of the so-called absolute spirit. He proclaimed that, quote, philosophy proper commences in the West, unquote. On the other hand, the philosophy of Eastern peoples was supposedly of lower quality, which didn't have any significance for philosophy generally. Europe, indeed, has been the power center of scientific and philosophical thought. The philosophy of ancient Greece rose to a high level and contained rudiments of many later forms of philosophy. In the Renaissance, in the 14th to 17th centuries, some of humanity's most significant scientific and philosophical trends were born in West Europe. The classical German philosophy of the late 18th and the early 19th century provided world historically significant philosophical doctrines. In Germany was also born dialectical materialism, which, continuing on the highway of philosophical development, leading from ancient Greek through classical German philosophy, has become the great revolutionary doctrine of the international proletariat, the banner of progressive humanity. However, all this does not mean that Europe alone is the cradle of philosophical knowledge, the way Eurocentric doctrines claim. Most modern bourgeois philosophers have adopted a Eurocentric position. Contrary to facts, they deny the existence of philosophical thought in the East, or consider Eastern philosophy entirely religious-mystical, something alien to rational thought and science, etc. In this, they are of course helped by religious idealists and mystics in the East. For example, F. Überweg claimed that the nations of the East had nothing resembling philosophy in the proper sense of the term. History of philosophy itself debunks the mistaken notion that Eastern philosophy had no role in the overall development of philosophy. Development of philosophical thought in the countries of the ancient East, Egypt, Babylonia, China and India, began long before the birth of ancient Greek philosophy, and enriched philosophy with many valuable materialist and dialectical doctrines. Later, Eastern philosophy developed approximately in a similar direction as Western philosophy, and both were influenced by each other. All this proves that Eurocentric theories about the stagnation of Eastern philosophy, the supposed eternal opposition and hostility of Eastern and Western ways of thinking, cannot be justified. Unquote. I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to Eastern philosophy, but some immediate examples that come to mind is that Greek philosophy obviously was influenced by Eastern philosophy. Nobody really denies that. And also, in the Middle Ages, many writings of Aristotle had actually been lost, and Europeans were only able to get those back from the Islamic world, because they were preserved and being studied over there. So really, all these idealist theories shatter into a million pieces, saying that some country is just magically special, like, ooh, how did they, how did this one country magically do this? Well, I mean, it's impressive what some countries can do, and what some peoples can do, but there's no superior race. There's material reasons why, in the past, it was the ancient East that was more advanced, then later Europe became economically more advanced. Any country can have great philosophers. Now lastly, just to drive home the point that Marxism doesn't think that all other philosophy is just nonsense because it's not Marxism or something, 
the creation of Marxism itself required earlier types of philosophy. So everybody knows that Hegel was important for Marxism. Some people know that Feuerbach was important for Marxism. But there were people before Hegel and Feuerbach. There were people before Kant. There were people before Descartes. Of course, some philosophers didn't necessarily contribute a whole lot. But many of them did, even if they were still fundamentally wrong. This is from Fundamentals of Marxist Philosophy. Quote, Idealist philosophy is a mistaken doctrine, but certain idealistic systems have contained rational kernels of knowledge concerning the world. Noteworthy idealist philosophers have advanced the understanding of certain aspects of reality, although generally they have understood the world idealistically, one-sidedly, wrong way around. Unquote. Quote, Without critically mastering and adapting, that which the most progressive philosophical thought of the past had created, the birth of dialectical materialism would not have been possible. Unquote. And to conclude, I'll just take a short statement by Soviet philosopher Ilyenkov from his Dialectics of the Abstract and Concrete in Marx's Capital. He puts it very precisely. He says, quote, In science, just as in all other fields of spiritual culture, Actual progress is always attained by further development of the values created by previous development, not by starting from scratch. It goes without saying that the assimilation of the results of previous theoretical development is not a matter of simply inheriting ready-made formulas, but rather a complex process of their critical reinterpretation, with reference to their correspondence to facts, life, practice. A new theory however revolutionary it might be in its content and significance, is always born in the course of critical reassessment of previous theoretical development. Unquote.